welcome for our next keynote, Professor Gerhard Fettweiss. So th thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting me here. I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of the opportunities of 5G in terms of real time and the opening up of the, what is called, or what we called, named the tactile internet, which you heard this morning already. Let's go back to the year 2005, Viale della Conciliazione. People know this. This is the road towards the Vatican. This was the day when Pope Benedict was to be announced. And obviously, last year, Pope Francisco was announced, and we know the difference. Now, the question is, if you look at the difference between two, those two pictures, it is basically using the phones as cameras. And yes, in this kind of scenario, as an operator, you can measure more uplink traffic than downlink traffic. And, however, none of these things are streaming into the network. So the question is not, do we need more capacity? Yes, we need the capacity. The question is, how do we get there? So we see the data rates increase over the years. And we see that um, I started putting up this slide in the year 2003. And the data rates have pretty much increased along Moore's law, 10x every five years, doubling every 18 months. So yes, we will see data rates in the year 2025 in the Wi-Fi area of a terabit per second. And 10 years later, 2035, we're going to see those in the cellular domain as well. So just get used to it, just as we have to get used to uh, brontobytes and things like that. Yes, things way larger than exabytes. We're going to also going to have to get used to these kind of data rates. Now the question obviously is, is this the only innovation ahead, a bigger pipe? Or is there something untapped that we forgot to look at or haven't really looked at so much? And it is waiting to be uncovered. It's the tactile internet, and it's millisecond. Let's get there. If we look at what happens, we see if we touch an object and move the object, then as we move the object, we expect to see the object being moved. If you remember when Angela Merkel was standing here giving her speech, you could see her wave her hands, and with quite some delay, you saw it on the screen. This was wave more than 10 milliseconds. What we do expect as humans is to see a reaction of our action in the range of one millisecond. Take virtual reality goggles, move your head. If the screens don't move within a millisecond time frame, you get sick to your stomach. Unless you're a fighter pilot, then you can adhere up to 10 milliseconds. So if we want to virtually move an object, move a virtual object, move a real object, we have to get down from today's best case, 25 milliseconds. Typically, in a 4G network, we have 50, down to the range of a single millisecond, end to end. This is not over the air only. This is from my device over the air to the control processor back to the device that is then controlling the object. This end-to-end round-trip time of one millisecond is obviously something to think about. Can this be done? Speed of light is one of the major issues because light travels only 300 kilometers within a millisecond. Yes, for us radio engineers, I'm a wireless radio guy, speed of light is always a major challenge. It's too slow for the bits to actually get from A to B. Um, so if we look at this and look at this kind of scenario, we have to see that others have come up with the idea, the concept that speed of light is an issue if we look at gaming parties, yes? They hook up in big halls to make sure that the latency is as minimum as possible. What can we do with this kind of scenario, this kind of setup? If all these people have their iPads, phones, whatever, or goggles, and sitting around somewhere, are there new applications awaiting to be invented? Yes. Let's, give me, let's have a look at this. If I look at this stadium, there are 80,000 cameras watching the game. 
not only the TV cameras, there are 80,000 cameras watching the game. If I hooked up all these cameras to a rendering engine, I could actually have what's called a free viewpoint video. I could calculate the viewpoint of this game from any single grass on the ground and watch the game from the viewpoint of the grass. Or I can say my favorite player is that white guy. He's looking at the red guy with a ball. And what do we want to make sure? That this is displayed in real time into our glasses. This is then free viewpoint video of an interactivity as if it was a Formula One race car with a camera mounted. Now these are people. They don't need cameras mounted. We just do this with rendering engines and the camera sitting around. And if you say that person is running too slow, then I'd rather be looking at the ball, and then I'm being dashed over this field at 200 kilometers per hour. With this kind of possibility, we can also take a scenario like this. If you have kids, your kids are auditioning here, what is the problem if you're sitting in the third or fourth row today, these days? Everybody holds up their iPads and you don't see your kids anymore because all you see are the iPads of the people in front of you. Yes, so what can we do? We can just quickly connect them, make it a rendering engine. You can walk around your kid as it is performing up here on stage doing whatever. Obviously, this also needs a humongous amount of data rate because we don't have time for video compression as we know today to get the latency down. It has to be below 10 milliseconds in this kind of scenario. Let's have a look at a different case. If we have a hazardous environment, not only Fukushima, but anything, and we have this robot and want to take care of the situation, what do we need to do today? We have to train people to ab be able to operate these robots. One of my favorite examples is when we bought our first house. I wanted to dig a trench. We, I rented a little excavation machine. And, and I got in there, and I nearly tore down my house because I didn't know how to use the knobs. If you try to move these robots and you're not trained for a couple months, good luck. So it is an issue. What would be much nicer is to have a humanoid robot pick up what we're doing in terms of movement. The humanoid robot walks in there, and then as we drop an object, we can catch it because within a millisecond reaction time, we coordinate. This is exactly what's happening. And right now, if you go and look at how these robots are being used, and even humanoid robots, it is this kind of slow motion speed. Yes, and nothing uh, spectacular is allowed to happen, otherwise you're in trouble. This obviously we can take into also the home care of elderly people, going from yesterday to today to tomorrow, where we have humanoid robots sitting at home. We don't have to wait for the four hours until the care person comes by, but the humanoid robots, we call up at call center, control center, somebody takes over the robot, picks us out of bed, takes us to the bathroom or whatever all, and then four hours later, somebody comes by, obviously, to take care of us in addition. So a huge new market also here with the human touch and feel. If we then say, let's go to our favorite example, yes, going to education. We all remember sitting in classes. I used to be one of the guys in the last bench, sort of like this. I remember that. Um, it is this one person talking, and it's pretty boring. If, however, we were able to put on virtual reality goggles, move around virtually in the old Rome, talk to each other, have speaker recognition, so that it tells us if we're if we're actually saying correct sentences, gives us points for that, then we can build a complete virtual environment, experience old Rome. We, this is interactivity, and as is known from educational sciences, we learn almost 10 times faster if we do this by experiencing than just being confronted with something. So we can actually improve the level of education for all kinds of language lessons, history lessons, whatever all, and also obviously natural sciences and things like that. With that being said, let's move to a further area that's going to be revolutionized. We heard about Industry 4.0. I want to talk about the tactile internet in industry. What do we see? 
we see an assembly line. It's an invention 100 years old. Robots can manufacture something, an identical thing. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Now, if you can buy the same car all over the planet, it becomes boring. We want to individualize. We want to not, not only have the same suit, we want to have different cars, different suits, different whatever all. So if we want to individualize, we need to build an assembly line where most of the robots are doing nothing because they have nothing to do with this certain customized product coming along. So forget about the assembly line. We have to go back to the assembly station where robots are whizzing around on the factory ceiling and floor, picking up pieces as needed in time, whizzing around and assembling them. What is the end-to-end -end control speed that we need in manufacturing? It is today, as is known, one millisecond because of the robot arms being about one meter fifty length. So you have a resonance frequency of 100 hertz. We have to sample 10 times faster. So you have to sample at a kilohertz and counter the resonance, and then we can control these things. So we need for this vision to become true, mobile robots with a wireless connectivity operating at a millisecond tactile internet speed. With this, we can create millions of new jobs, not only in engineering, but think of all the designers that now go and open up custom design stores in the shopping malls and make sure that they help you design your outfit, your product as needed. Fantastic new area of, uh, for new jobs for people that currently are desperately looking for jobs to take, the artistic-minded people. Let's move one further step. We're in Germany, so we have to talk about cars. Yes, cars obviously move along streets and have traffic lights, and we want to get rid of traffic lights and get rid of streets because of it. The person walking around has a personal bubble turned on with its mobile phone, and if everything is organized in a millisecond, even the frog with its phone turned on can cross the street and is not hit by a car. Now, if you think this is futuristic, no. Look at this. This is actually happening already quite some years ago in the US. It was tested. You see here this intersection. Traffic lights are turned on. Everything's moving like normal. And now the tactile internet happens, yes? So this is the way the future is going to be. <laughs> And don't worry, everything's under control. Everything's within one millisecond tactile control. <laughs> Even the police cars react correctly, yes. <laughs> OK, so with this being said, what is it? If we look at communications of today, it is about moving content. This is the net neutrality network that we're talking about today. Tomorrow, it is about moving objects, controlling and steering virtual and real objects. We need a complete different service class, as, just as our chancellor had mentioned this, earlier this morning. And with that, we can enable industries with a huge amount of potential. If we look at that, we do not only have to do research on how to beat this wireless communication, reliability, resilience, etc., and the networks, we also have to look at how to build these chips to make this happen, how to make the mobile edge cloud happen, because the cloud controlling this does not allow, is not allowed to be sitting in Alaska. It has to be as close as possible, sitting in the base station. And we have to look at the applications. And to have the look at that, we, in, we generated the 5G Lab Germany in Dresden, collaborating with these four companies so far, inviting many others to join, to make sure that this vision comes true. Why is this vision so important? Because it's a huge market. If we just look at Germany and just the telco operator's opportunity, in care, it's at least an 8 billion market. In manufacturing, it's at least a 10 billion market. If you talk to Volkswagen, they want a Vodafone, a Deutsche Telekom, whoever to take over their factory, run the IT control system, and make sure that this happens. This is not their core line of business as a car manufacturer. Events is another 5 billion, edutainment is another 10 billion, mobility is another 12 billion, smart grid is another 10 billion. Here again, the co-phasing of the different suppliers has to be within 10 to 20 degrees, otherwise you get short circuits. So with this being said, and then new markets, it's a huge market. Germany is 5% of the world's GDP. 
multiply by 20. An operator is typically 10% of the value chain are multiplied by 10. So this is a 20 trillion US market of a, 20, of a 75 GDP today. It is Europe's chance because look at those markets. The markets I put up there, these are strongholds for Europe. And we have to make sure that we develop, develop this technology in these markets, talking to the different players in these markets. And with this being said, I think we have a fantastic future and 5G is going to make it. Um, thank you, Professor. I just, yes, I just want to um, ask you before I introduce the next speaker, are you saying it is going to happen anyway or are you saying it is only going to happen if we have the investment from European governments, if, if we talk about Europe's chance? So I think it is, I think this vision in the meantime, people have picked it up, seen that this is going to happen. However, it could happen with or without Europe. Yes, okay. so if you look at the investment being made in Asian countries, in other countries on the planet, if Europe wants to play a major role, this is where European countries have to put the some money. funds into the game. Otherwise, they're going to lose the pole position. Yeah. I put on those different business markets, economic markets, yes? Yeah. Europe has a pole position in these markets, and but it, it could can lose, lose it. It could time. lose it without that investment. Thank you very much um, for setting